All right, thank you for joining us for our PHSR Research and Progress Series webinar today. Um, our topic, or our general theme is Public Health Cost, Quality, Value, Workforce Enhancement. Our topic today is Building Access and Understanding Law and Public Health Practice in Nebraska. Our speakers today are, or presenters today are Jennifer Ibrahim. Um, she's an Associate Professor and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Public Health at Temple University. Also an Associate Director of the Public Health Law Research Program. Um, her current area of research focuses on the intersection of public health systems and services with public health law, as well as ongoing work in the area of state and local tobacco control policy. Um, we also have Elizabeth Platt joining us. Elizabeth is a Senior Legal Analyst at Legal Science Partners. Um, prior to joining LSP, she was the Senior Legal Research Associate with the Public Health Law Research National Program Office um, at Temple as well. Um, so, and I'm Rick Ingram, I'm your moderator today. So with that, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Jennifer? Great, thank you so much for the introduction. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to share where we are right now with this project. And uh, for, for all of you on the phone who are uh, academics, this is an academic dream come true to have the lines muted where I can talk and nobody can interrupt. So <laughs> you can all uh, chime in with questions, um, concerns. I would love to have a discussion um, and at the end of the presentation, all of my contact information is there. Um, what I'm really hoping at the end of this presentation is it really sparks a lot more questions, some interest, um, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about where we're going with some of our next steps. So I just want to um, make sure I acknowledge all the folks that were part of this team, both the folks based at Temple University within the Public Health Law Research Program, um, and then our, our collaborators at the Department of Health and Human Services in Nebraska, Daryl Klein, who's on the phone and will be commenting at the end of the presentation, and Colleen Svoboda, um, who was also a, a critical part of, of the success of this project. And of course, thank you to PHSSR for their generous funding. So there's a big challenge that um, when we're talking about public health practitioners and we're thinking about issues of public health law, there's a big challenge of how do we go about accessing the law in a way that is English, is intelligible, um, and something that we can understand. And it can be both a challenge and a major frustration. And a lot of times folks sort of throw up their hands and say, that's somebody else's job, I'll leave it to my public health attorney. But we know that in many times, um, particularly at the local level, access to a public health attorney is something that's uh, few and far between. So folks end up having this whole sense of feeling confused and lost um, and frustrated and in some previous work I had done, a lot of the sentiment when you talk to public health practitioners about law was that it was sort of a nuisance. Uh, it's something that's there. Folks talked about litigation, and they talked about that being the role for the, the attorneys. However, we know that law is a critical part of public health practice. Things that we see every single day, ranging from the food safety, um, catastrophic events or, or the rare epidemics that we saw with Ebola day-to-day, um, -day, particularly now as we're heading back to school, um, vaccination issues, um, and things like prescription drug monitoring, we know that law is a critical piece of the work that public health practitioners do, and there's a great potential for law to be used as a tool to promote and protect health as opposed to what lots of folks have the perception it being more of a nuisance. One of the, the other big challenges putting on the academic hat now um, is when we're looking at research and evaluation on public health laws, we know that there's a major challenge in terms of the accessibility of data. There are plenty of different policy and legal databases that are out there. However, they're only evaluating or measuring a policy or a law at a dichotomous level or at best a categorical level. We're not getting down to the level of individual provisions, which is where we see um, potentially the greatest impact for a difference. Um, so looking at uh, issues with implementation, looking at issues with enforcement. So for example, what are the range of different fines? Is it a one-time fine? Is it a stepwise fine where the penalty increases for, for multiple offenses? Um, it's important for us to be able to get down to that level of detail within the law but also making sure that we are looking at change in the laws over time and not just a snapshot, which is what you see a lot of on the advocacy websites, you know, the cross-sectional point in time, and then also being able to, to look across jurisdictions as a way for us to learn from others. 
So, and again, now I'm going to flip back to the practitioner side. In addition to needing the data um, to be able to do evaluations, it's also critical that we have uh, a point of access for public health practitioners who can get a sense of what does the law say and how does the law impact my authority to act. I think quite often in public health we tend to be a little bit more um, conservative in the way that we act and we think that we don't have the authority to carry out certain actions when in fact under the law there's a lot of latitude and, and if interpreted um, properly uh, with the with assistance consultation from a public health attorney there's actually a lot that public health practitioners can be doing to advance health. So all of this really fed into the thinking that we had for putting this project together, we ended up calling it Building Access and Understanding of Public Health Law in Nebraska. And this stemmed, I know lots of folks will say to me, how did you end up partnering with Nebraska? People typically think of California or New York, um, but Nebraska has really been an unknown gem. Um, what they have been doing, even prior to us working on this grant, in terms of thinking about the law, um, analyzing the law, collecting the laws, was really far ahead of its time, ahead of anyone else that I had opportunities to interact with at the state level. So based on a previous project I had worked on, I started collaborating with Daryl Klein um, and the former health commissioner, um, Dr. Schaefer, thinking about how could we do this? How could we go about change access and understanding for the public health practitioner population in Nebraska at the state and local level? And just as a, a point of reference, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but for folks who are interested in sort of jumping into my brain and seeing a little bit more about what went into this, this is just a snapshot of the conceptual diagram that we had put together. And this was a, a collaborative paper between PHLR and PHSSR um, that Glenn and Scotch and Scott Burris and I had put together um, that was in Millbank Quarterly a few years back looking at the way law potentially could be impacting the way we carry out our essential health function, essential public health services, um, and the fact that it could be an opportunity for us to leverage our legal authority to, um, as a tool to help people be more effective in delivering health services. So if you, if you haven't seen that, this is a good paper just to get a sense of the, the background of where we came from for this project. So the main study aims for this project, first and foremost, and this was really the foundation. You have lost. And if you could flip, something happened and it, I just was disconnected. So if you could flip the slides for me. For sure. Study aims is up. Aim okay, one. so, and I'm just going from my local slide, so I'll just say uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So the study aims, as I was saying, first and foremost was the issue that um, we needed to build this uh, collection of laws. And so we started working with uh, Daryl to systematically go through and collect all of the laws in Nebraska that govern the authority of public health agencies at both the state and local level to perform essential public health services. And you'll hear that this definition grew a little bit broader over the course of time. Um, but it was, it was a critical piece that we, the academic side of the project over at Temple, was working hand in hand every single week having meetings talking through what was the scope um, to make sure that in the end this project was something that was really going to be useful to the folks in Nebraska and not just an academic exercise. Um, once we had uh, gone through and collected all those laws, Aim two was to go through and code them and to create an online public, uh, policy surveillance system that folks in Nebraska could go and access. So you'll see later on, um, we'll post up the URL to the site, um, but anybody can go there and you can get a sense of what are the laws at the state level and right now the two, large, uh, the two largest jurisdictions um, at the local level and get a whole sense of what can, what can public health practitioners do in Nebraska. The next step, um, in once we had created that policy surveillance tool, we wanted to release it and see how that had an impact on public health practitioners' day-to-day -day work. So in order to assess that, um, we had put in place a baseline survey to assess the perceptions of law and the actual use of law among the public health practitioners in Nebraska, 
um, at baseline and then a six-month follow-up. And so the baseline was back in January, and the six-month follow-up is actually out in the field right now. So I'll share some of the baseline findings, and there's a, a teaser for folks to come back um, and look for the articles that we will be sharing the six-month follow-up survey as well. And then the last piece was sort of to make the case for the utility of this whole project um, to actually go through and demonstrate how we could conduct an evaluation on the impact of a particular law. And the idea was to show that we could take our policy surveillance legal data set, merge it with some of the existing EPI data within the health department, demonstrate that this policy surveillance tool is also really useful to policymakers that if there's a law that there's a sunset provision or some other demand where there needs to be a quick evaluation, you've already got the legal provisions coded. You've already got the EPI data available. So it's not going to be that difficult to pull together, even if it's a, a rough estimate of the impact, to see is this something that's working and we need to continue, or is this something that is not working and we should amend or discontinue. Uh, next slide. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, the, one of the project managers on the team, Elizabeth Platt, and she's going to walk you through building the Law Atlas system for Nebraska. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep, I can hear you. All right, perfect. So to start with, we developed the scope of the laws that we wanted to include in the system. Our scope included both state statutes and regulations, as well as local ordinances. Our general goal was to include the laws that directly impact the Department of Health, as Jen mentioned. So in collaboration with the Nebraska team, we would start with more general topics and then flesh out the more specific areas of the law that we wanted to be sure that we captured. In certain subjects, however, this involves going into different areas of the law beyond the health sphere. For example, the general topic, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, when looking at driving under the influence, we wanted to capture the larger authority um, to act and enforcement pieces. So to do so, we needed to go into the criminal code to look at the penalty of it. So from there, we started a topical framework from the Nebraska team, and we worked closely to develop the comprehensive scope, which is organized into these main topics that you'll see in a little bit. Um, because it would have been hard for us in Philadelphia to get our hands on many of the local laws, we also needed to work closely with the Nebraska team who helped gather the laws that we were then able to verify with the secondary source. So next slide, please. Um, within each subject, we then drafted a set of questions that would capture the important features of the law for that subject. For example, our healthcare professions data set, we would create a question asking about licensure requirements for that particular um, profession. We would then code these questions using the text of the uh, law. At this stage, it was important to draft questions so that they are not only user-friendly, but general enough to be used again for local laws or for other states in the future. For example, in our Clean Indoor Air Act data set, we ask about the locations where smoking is prohibited under that act. This question can then be reused at the local level or in other states to ask what locations are prohibited in that particular state or city. Once we created the question set for each topic, like I said, our team would code the law by answering all the questions using those laws that we scoped for that topic in our content management system that we're at. Next slide. So these are the major topical areas that we covered. Within each of these topics, we had several subcategories that drilled down into more specific areas. This is what we would call an inventory data set on our end. This means that it would show you the state of the law within each general topic areas, and it's display, um, it would display in a table format, which you'll see in a little bit. Next slide, please. Uh, once we had all of the laws coded in each of these topics, we then published each data set to this front end, which you see here. This is the final display. You can navigate through each of those main topic links to get into the more specific areas of the law. For example, if you click on the link to alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, you will get to the data set on, on Nebraska Clean Indoor Air Act that I just mentioned. Uh, once you go to the website, which is available at www 
www.lawatlas backslash Nebraska with a lowercase n. You can also access the local level laws data set, which on the next slide we'll see a little glimpse of. You go to the next slide, please. Thanks. And then we use the same process that I mentioned to code the local level laws in both Omaha and Lincoln. This shows a screenshot of a particular data set for both the local level page and it, on the right is the state level page. Each individual data set page will contain a table with our coding answers for each question and a citation to the law that answers each question. All of this is freely available on lawatlas.org backslash Nebraska, including the supporting documents that elaborate on the specific process we use to create each of these data sets, and you can also download the data from our coding. And now it's next slide, and Jen will discuss the workforce assessment. And I just want to say, it, you know, Lizzie <coughs> walked through those, those slides, but seeing the static slides really doesn't do justice. <clears throat> I would strongly encourage that if you're interested, go to the website, poke around, look and see what's there, um, and, and reach out and talk to us. <coughs> um, as I mentioned, one of the pieces that we wanted to know was we have this hypothesis that if you build it, they will come and it will be helpful. So we conducted this workforce assessment to get a better understanding of um, what do the public health practitioners within Nebraska think about law and how are they engaging with law. And this was pretty, in, pretty informative. And um, so you'll see we, had, we partnered with the Public Health Association of Nebraska to get the survey out. There wasn't one main uh, list of contacts that we could send out and, and count exactly how many people was the total population we were sending it out to. We were really trying to get a wide swath of the population. This was more of an assessment than a real systematic evaluation. Um, we had 155 individuals who responded. You can see here that there were about 37% were um, staff members, 34% program members, and about 11% were executive level individuals. And we had a range um, uh, of folks who were working in the health department for a range of, of different so one of the first things we asked, and this I thought was very interesting, was um, when you are trying to learn more about a public health law, where do you go? What do you do? And you can see the distribution here, and it's really kind of disturbing that a lot of people are turning to Google. It's not surprising, um, but Google has not yet bested the law world um, in order for uh, it to be turning back the information that you really want. Uh, you know, I always tell my children, believe half of what you find on Google because you just don't know who's posting it up there. Um, other folks were going to state legislative websites, which could be good, but um, just from our poking around through the website, there were certainly a number of things that were not up to date. Um, there were some things that were incorrect. There were some documents that you, to click on um, that said it was up to date, but it wasn't the most recent PDF. So there's definitely a number of potential um, pitfalls here in terms of the way folks were currently accessing the law. We wanted to get some sense um, to make sure that we were covering the appropriate topic areas as Lizzie went over. We wanted to get some sense of the major issues that folks were dealing with. Um, the top issues uh, that folks selected were alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Um, in some of the open comments, other drugs was particularly important. Um, Health professions and practice, so getting an understanding of what health professionals can and cannot do. Uh, vital statistics and surveillance, and in that bucket, um, particularly issues of privacy came up. And then chronic disease and We also asked folks, how often do you think about public health law? Um, as I said, in previous work that I had done, um, conducting an assessment of the public health lawyers and the state health officers for all 50 states, one of the things that we were trying to understand is how are people even just thinking about law, something that we're calling their legal consciousness. Um, and so we asked the folks in Nebraska, how often do you think about law? And you can see that folks who um, were in their position for less than five years um, were thinking about law much less. Folks who had been in the position longer, um, that's where you see they were to the far right, they were thinking about it more than six times a week. Um, also, and I didn't put all the break, breakdowns here, it will be in the paper that we're in the process of writing once we have the follow-up data, um, but the folks um, who are in this 33%, the dark red, 
thinking about law more often um, were also more uh, executive level folks who had access to public health attorneys in a way that um, some of the more local individuals did not have access. Um, we wanted to get a sense of how do the practitioners feel in terms of their level of confidence engaging with law. Um, is it something that's intimidating, particularly if folks don't have um, even on-the-job training or some doing a webinar like this, for example? So we asked them, how confident do you feel in contacting the right person if you have to discuss an issue of public health law? And you could see that level of confidence was pretty low. Um, how do you... Uh, how, how confident are you in discussing an issue if you do get before a public health lawyer? Um, and you can see, and this was interesting, people who had been in the position for um, a shorter period of time felt they were more confident in doing that than folks who had been in the position for a longer period of time. And in some of the open comments, I think that actually speaks a little bit to um, a naive sense of it. The, Folks who were saying that they were more confident, I think, were deferring towards the attorney as opposed to really engaging and in, in having a conversation. Uh, and then the last piece, how confident do you feel in conducting a meeting where you're discussing issues related to public health law? You can see the level of confidence was uh, much higher there, 60 and 68. We also asked um, what were additional resources that were needed, and part of it was we really wanted to see, as we're building this policy surveillance tool, are there additional resources that public health practitioners are looking for to help them carrying out their day-to-day -day responsibilities? And the top additional resources that were listed and requested was an online directory of laws. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, okay, jackpot, we're heading in the right direction. Um, hopefully, if you build it, they will come. Uh, in-person workshops, and I'll talk a little bit about our next steps that we're going to be doing uh, in Nebraska as a follow-up to this project, uh, live webinars such as this one, and um, also folks who are interested in some sort of credentialing, such as a certificate program in public health law, that they felt that they would be more confident if not only did they know the material, but there was some way they could demonstrate to others that they had a certain uh, proficiency and they'd, they had mastered certain competencies in this area. So as I mentioned, um, we're in the process of doing the six-month follow-up and that information um, will be forthcoming in September. We'll be closing out that survey in the next week, week or two, um, and then we'll be sharing that information at some upcoming meetings we've scheduled in September. So the other piece that's also in progress right now, as I mentioned, is going through and being able to demonstrate the integration of one of the legal data sets with the existing surveillance data within the health department. And the area that we picked was looking at clean indoor air laws, um, and we're looking at two different outcomes, looking at actual exposure to secondhand smoke, how that's changed over time, and then also looking at enforcement and infractions of the law. So the assessment getting at the workforce piece and actually you know, the way practitioners are carrying out their job, how laws are helping or hindering, and then the other piece is the behavioral and how laws are protecting population health. What's interesting here is a lot of the assessments uh, that are currently out there are much more focused on a higher level. As I said at the beginning, the dichotomous variable, is there a clean indoor air law, yes or no? What we're really doing here, and it's, it's been very interesting, picking through at the provision level, looking at the differences in over time, with uh, modifications to uh, some of the enforcement stuff, some of the penalties, um, and then, of course, the, the scope of where those clean indoor air laws are, are restricting use of tobacco products. So again, oh, it went too fast. So again, this is something else um, that we're in the process of preparing that analysis, uh, and, and that should be coming out at the end of the grant, which would be September, October. So I want to speak a little bit to the implications. Um, I know when Daryl comments that he'll have some additional thoughts on the implications, but really the, the importance of this project to us um, is, a, is a couple of different dimensions. Um, I think it's really a great way to improve awareness of the law as a way to advance health. Um, we know that budgets are really cramped. We know that folks are constantly hearing about budget crisis um, and cuts, particularly at the local level. This is a way that the law is already out there, and if we can um, increase awareness of the legal authority to act, this could be another way to help folks 
do more with less, for lack of a better way of putting it. We also think that this is a really great way if folks become more aware, um, and also for public health lawyers, when you have all this information in front of you, to be thinking critically about updating the law. Um, and Daryl can touch on this, but even as we went through and we were having some conversations, it was clear that some of the verbiage in the law, some of the approaches in the law, um, particularly those laws that had not been updated for decades, these were areas when we're thinking about population health, newer isn't always better. Sometimes it's better to go back and see about making amendments to what's already there. And if you can move the slides, it just kicked me off again. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Clearly, it doesn't like me today. Um, and then the last piece, which I alluded to earlier, is the evaluation to generate evidence. You know, having these data sets in place is a critical way um, to provide real-time assessment. And so if there is a debate or discussion, I think one of the biggest challenges in policymaking is the lack of evidence. Um, and decisions are made and then evaluations are funded and implemented after the fact and then there's no going back to change the policies. Having these data sets in place, looking across jurisdictions and lessons learned from other locations will be a great way to better inform policymaking um, across the United States at the state and local level. The last thing I want to share is just to give you some sense of some of the next steps. Um, we are in conversation and collaboration with a couple of different organizations, um, ASTO, the, state, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, um, talking about specifically, um, we actually have a call at 1 o'clock, working with the Public Health Lawyers Group, thinking about ways that is this something that we can be expanding and working with other states. You know, my idea would be, you know, in 10 years from now, if we actually had this system across all 50 states, I really see this as a, a critical piece of public health that's sort of been the missing link. Um, and I think there's great, what we've learned from Nebraska is that there's great opportunity um, for, for helping public health practitioners do more with less. We're also having conversations with the National Association of City and County Health Officials and the National Association of Local Boards of Health. As I mentioned, a lot of this, a lot of what we, I've talked about so far has been focused at the state level but we're also working more within the context of this project um, and Lizzie's team and some of the, the folks at Public Health Law Research are also working on implementing these types of policy inventories at the local level where we see you know, a vast majority of the innovation in public health policy at the local level. I think it's critical for us to be able to capture that somehow and share it widely um, so that people can and live and learn from the experiences of others. Uh, and then lastly, lastly, in terms of next steps, being able to do more to share this research methodology, um, to push this area of research for, further. Um, we, at our public health law research meeting back in January, we had hosted a junior scholars track, and one of the biggest things that we heard folks at that session talking about was um, getting more information on research methodology to drive evaluations of policies and law. So we are very fortunate at PHLR that we have a, a small army of public health lawyers that have been working with us. We have started to bring on um, some folks from public health, but having public health students and lawyers um, or law students, and we even have some of the JD MPH students learning this, is something that it will just become ingrained as part of the, the the same way they learn program evaluation, having them understand how to go through and break down law so that it's something no different than any other piece of data, I think is really important if we're going to drive evidence-based policy making. Um, and the role that I play within our college as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, this is something that we're doing a lot to push into our curriculum so that our students are getting more of this, they understand it, and they can be actually out there implementing this type of research. That's the end of the comments that I have, and uh, I'll turn it back to Rick. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. We have um, on the line to kind of react or comment on your presentation, we have um, Daryl Klein. Daryl is the Assistant Agency Counsel in the Legal Services Division for the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. Um, he's done that since July 1989. 
and supports the Division of Public Health. Uh, he participates in various roles in the department, including the state's ongoing development and implementation of public health emergency management responsibilities for all hazards response, with an emphasis on bioterrorism and infectious disease. Um, so, Daryl, would you like to comment on their presentation? Sure. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to participate today. And I see from the participant list that you know some of what we're going to be saying or what I'll say is preaching to the choir here. Um, my notes, and these are just random uh, thoughts that I had from the Nebraska experience, not necessarily in a cohesive order, but that's the way I tend to think anyway. Um, first off, when when I was first talking with Jen and found out that they were working on an object, objective evaluation of the law rather than just uh, basically intuition, which is what I think happens in a lot of, of the legislative process. This ought to work. Uh, some legislation is passed based upon um, other states' experience, which, is, which comes closer to being kind of an um, objective approach to try to advance public policy. But a lot of it just seems to be driven by intu intuition. And toward that end, then the law atlas, um, the, the key points that, that Jen made that I totally agree with very quickly would just be increasing awareness of the law and uh, getting folks who are working in public health to view uh, public health law as a tool as opposed to an obstacle. And depending on the lawyer you're working with, the law can frequently be thrown up as an obstacle because lawyers, um, many lawyers enter law school as still being relatively normal human beings. And uh, then law school tends to drill into folks um, all of the horrible consequences that can occur if you take any action. So typically, lawyers are going to be risk averse. So you need to work with your lawyer to try to overcome that so that under the legal framework you're operating, you can find a way to accomplish what, what you need to do. You might change how you go about doing it, but you might arrive at the same end. So toward that end, uh, the public health worker and, and then new public health lawyers coming up, the, um, the greater opportunity they have to be exposed to and have an understanding of a law is just going to lead to better results. That's all there is to it. Um, I was at the uh, De, De Beaumont Foundation Public Health Workforce Development Conference. And uh, so the folks there who had been asked to attend and share their ideas uh, were clearly uh, well versed in public health. And one of them made a comment at the meeting. Um, I was there as part of the ASTO workforce uh, of public health lawyers. And her comment, and she wasn't being uh, critical or sarcastic, she said she didn't know that there was such a thing as public health law. So that's kind of uh, illustrative. We have a uh, public health workforce right now that by funding stream has, has become siloed. Um, folks are driven by the deliverables that they have to uh, achieve to fulfill their grant requirements. And in some instances, if it's general funding, um, they're siloed a little bit because their program has a specific set of statutes to, uh, to carry out and work with. And so if you can develop um, a non-intimidating, uh, intuitive, user-friendly way to have the public health workforce access the law and understand it, even in areas that they don't necessarily work normally, it is going to lead to a breakdown of these silos. And I think that that's going to advance um, workforce development. The the internet um, interactive question format, I think, is way more intuitive for, for young folks at least coming up and, and for those of us who have adapted to changes in technology. Um, just way superior for in, in approach for a lay person to look at the law than digging into the actual uh, statutes, whether they're looking at them online or whether they're actually looking at the printed uh, statutes, because um, as Jen kind of uh, mentioned before, and this I think is true of almost every state, you, you might look at the law that you think uh, applies and believe that you've had your question answered. But there might be another law either in that same chapter or in a totally different chapter that also impacts it. So when you have a compilation of the laws that touch on a subject and present it in this question format, I, I think it's, it's simply way more intuitive for most folks than looking up the law. As Jen mentioned, as, and as the, the lawyers who are participating here have no doubt experienced, uh, many, many folks 
are just intimidated by the law. The minute they realize the law applies, um, they, they kind of abdicate or abrogate their responsibilities. Abdicate, I guess they don't do that because they want to keep getting paid. But they, uh, they kick it over to the lawyer. And yeah, frequently, you know, I have to bite my tongue to say, these laws, believe it or not, are actually written in English, and, and you're proficient in that. So read them and see what they say. However, that's not always true. Sometimes they're, they're difficult to decipher. So the Law Atlas question and answer format, I think, is just um, a great way to go. One of the uh, issues I see down the line is sustaining the Law Atlas site. Uh, as Jen said, when, when uh, folks do, when it's academics or, or legal or a combination of both, taking a snapshot of the uh, nation's laws on a particular subject, you really are just getting a snapshot there. And I think for, to, for a law atlas for this interactive approach to be um, achieve its maximum effectiveness, uh, folks who are looking into this need to build a way to sustain it. And what we're going to be looking at uh, down the road, Colleen Swoboda and I are going to be looking at working with the, uh, the uh, College of Public Health here in Nebraska and in particularly their, their, uh, their JDMPH program, because it strikes me that, um, that they will have uh, an ongoing stream of interested folks who are looking to advance their knowledge uh, for use in their future careers that would just ideally play into this. And once the framework has been set up, as the great folks at Temple have done, um, just keeping an update on these, on these subject areas so that it's fresh and it's reliable uh, would be very important, and we're looking uh, at a way to achieve that. So that's, those are my comments. Thanks, Daryl. Um, Jennifer or Elizabeth, do you have any response to kind of Daryl's comments? Any, any thoughts? I just wanted to, and I'm glad Daryl touched on that, that the sustainability piece. I think what I was saying um, in terms of that getting the next generation of public health researchers um, understanding this, and not just the, the lawyers, but both sides, the MPHs and the, the PhDs and the DRPHs, as well as the JDs, um, getting them not only to understand the methodology, but getting them to understand how to work together as a team, um, I think that starts to become a natural way for us to have the sustainability. Um, we're looking at some of that here within Temple, that if we're doing these types of projects um, at the, within the, the MPH programs, our master's students always have to do a field work project, and so this could be something that they could be working on, helping to do the updates and learning the methodology at the same time. Um, so I think the sustainability is a really important piece. I think the more folks start using this, and hopefully if we can expand this to other states and people see the utility of it, the demand for that update is going to be greater and greater. I think the other piece, too, is it's a free resource, and so there are certainly plenty of students that have uh, projects they need to do for classes and that type of thing. So I would encourage folks uh, to you know, let their students know that this is a, a great resource. Um, we're in the process of adding some links within each of the Law Atlas pages to data within Nebraska. And I would encourage your students that if they're working on an assessment, that they should reach out to the folks in Nebraska. Um, there's no reason to just do it as an academic exercise if a student is doing an analysis. It could be something that's really helpful to the health department, and it might be something that they hadn't looked at it from that perspective. Um, so I think this opens the door for a lot more collaboration. This is sort of C minus one. Um, when we submitted this grant, you know, there were plenty of folks who said to us, this isn't possible, it's not doable. Um, we greatly appreciate the faith that the folks at PHSSR had for us and in us to do this. Um, and I really, you know, I hope that, like I said, in five to 10 years, um, this is a whole different conversation, and we're looking at a set of 50 of these as opposed to just uh, the one case in Nebraska. Thanks for your comments. Um, so now we've got time for uh, kind of just general questions from the folks who are on the webinar. Um, so Julie Costas had a comment, uh, Jennifer and Elizabeth, uh, essentially kind of focused on you know, there's fairly state, well, there's fairly, um, there's a lot of variety, you know, between states and their legal um, and their legal legal statutes. And 
it seems that that is a big issue regarding kind of making comparisons among states. Um, so do you have any thoughts about kind of just the general variation between states in their public health law and how that might impact other states attempts to do something you've been doing? I think, I think what's important is folks like to compare. Um, and, I, and I think it shouldn't be competitive comparisons. It should be comparisons for the sake of learning. And so when you see these different com comparisons, it shouldn't be a matter of, well, they're doing better than us on this, that, or the other. It should be looking and saying, huh, I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, as we start to build out other states, one of the key things that we did, we were very careful in the terminology that we were using. We worked closely with Daryl and Colleen to make sure that we were using terms that weren't a purely academic taxonomy, but it was something so that if somebody in Lincoln, Nebraska, went to the Law Atlas site and was trying to find something about phytal statistics, um, they could go and find it in the terminology that they were most used to using, you know, the, the common verbiage. But we also were sensitive to looking behind the scenes at a way that we could have um, consistent buckets so that we have an infrastructure and a template that could be applied to the next state that we work with. So I think the comparisons are a good thing. Um, from a research perspective, it's a way for us to do evaluation, but from a practitioner's perspective, again, it's a way for people to learn about that variation and, and benefit from it. I know one of the other questions that was posted up was about other states um, that are in this format. So Nebraska was the first state that we did this broad inventory, and we're looking to partner um, and, and replicate this in some other states. And certainly there's every state we do, there's going to be some different challenges, and we'll continue to learn. Um, however, the, the reverse of it, instead of focusing as the state as the case, if you go to lawatlas.org more generally, what you will see is 50 states comparisons by topic area. So within our project here, we covered a wide range of topics if you go to lawatlas.org, you could pick a particular topic like prescription drug monitoring, and you could see the state of law across the 50 states. Great. Thanks. I mean, that kind of you know, leads into a question again, Kelly had. Just do you all know of any other law atlas um, kind of format that exists for any other states in Nebraska? Or is it kind of just the, your, to, your, to, your, to your knowledge the only kind of this animal that exists right now? To the best of my knowledge, this is the only ex the only type of approach like this that exists. You know, as I mentioned, there are advocacy websites that have snapshots, but I don't know of anything else that gives you the the cross sectional variation that gives you the longitudinal variation and is interactive, as opposed to just clicking and you get what you get when when the website pops up. Great. Um, we've got a question from Nan Failer. Um, she. Right. Did you notice difference in health department legal support? Um, for example, you know, city attorneys, outside counsel, no attorney support, things like that. So is there any sort of variation in what kind of support these agencies might get? So we weren't specifically looking at this with this project, yeah. but I can tell you that there there is variation, and I'll let Daryl dig a little bit deeper on that. Um, but there was another project that I had worked on a couple years ago, and that's how I met um, Daryl, where we were going through and looking at the relationship and the level of collaboration between public health attorneys and the state health official, and then we had a random sample of local health officials, and there's huge variation. There are some local jurisdictions where there is no attorney support. Um, there are some where they contract with a private attorney, and because of the cost associated with every time they reach out to that attorney, they really don't reach out to the attorney. So this could even be sort of a stopgap that for those local jurisdictions, this would give them some access to law and have some level of information before they decide they are or are not going to contact a, a local attorney. But Daryl, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, ab absolutely, Jen. And, and everything you said is, is yeah, right on my experience. Generally, um, well, in Nebraska, the, the public health agency has always had um, in-house counsel. Now, at, as, at about 30 years ago, that, that was one uh, full-time attorney. And uh, then it peaked probably at nine public health attorneys, and now we're at three and a half FTEs devoted just to public health. Um, but we're embedded in the agency, and I'm literally 100 feet away from my director. So if either of us has a question, 
uh, typically we just walk over and, and talk with each other about it, and that's been very helpful. The other typical approach at the uh, state level is to have uh, an attorney in the uh, attorney general's office uh, assigned to support a particular executive agency, and there might be more than one supporting an executive agency, but they report to a different boss, and they have multiple assignments and responsibilities, so their exposure, you know, practice makes perfect. Their exposure to it's going to be less, and, and so their, the depth of their, well, and, and the time that they have, not just the depth of their anal analysis, but uh, competing time demands are going to impact um, the sort of support that they can give. And then at the local level, I guess I will say for the, for the two large metropolitan areas uh, locally covered in, uh, in Law Atlas, Nebraska, um, Omaha is a, uh, it's actually the Douglas County Health Department, and Omaha by ordinance has given uh, authority over health matters to the county agency. And Lincoln-Lancaster County is a joint city-county agency. And in each of those, there is, uh, there's a dedicated uh, attorney to support the uh, public health work of the city in Omaha, and, and that's also the county, countywide. And in, same thing in Lincoln-Lancaster County. There is a uh, Lincoln City attorney who de facto does most of the support, but they also have uh, a designated county attorney there too. And then out state for our local public health departments, uh, they, the multi-county health departments, uh, they don't have dedicated legal support. If they want it, they need to get it by contract or uh, work with one of the county attorneys uh, who's a member of the constituent counties. Some of them, uh, by experience, for instance, uh, dealing with uh, TB uh, commitments, some of them are quite familiar with public health law. Uh, some of them, it is alien, and they would say, I didn't know there was such a thing as public health law. And then the la lastly, when they do contract with private attorneys, it has been my experience that they are apt to get bad advice as often as good advice. And so it does vary tremendously. Um, if you don't mind here, I'm going to jump in. Denise Chrysler asked if the uh, review includes court interpretations of law and uh, AG interpretations. I, I will say this. Um, d during the review, if you go to the Clean Indoor Air Act uh, on Nebraska Law Atlas and you look at the, uh, the exemption uh, category, there's, uh, this came up while the, uh, while the Temple folks were analyzing the law, and we did talk about it. And the link there where they, uh, if you if you're looking at the answer to the question and you click on the little section symbol, it'll take you to the actual uh, statute, and, and it's an annotated version of the statute. So they have in there where the, uh, one of the exemptions was found uh, unconstitutional. So yes, for the court cases. Um, I do not believe that there is, um, I guess it would be possible to try to build links into the AG's uh, opinions. Our AG's opinions are generally only issued to uh, legislators or uh, state agency officials, and they've been kind of sparse over time recently, um, basically just because the AG hasn't been asked to be giving the opinions. So that didn't, I'll be frank with you, Denise, it didn't uh, occur to me to jump out and do that. The other um, aspect there is the, uh, the executive agencies of the state are bound by attorney general opinions, and everybody else can just treat them as, as another attorney's opinion. So I will now shut up. Thanks so much, Daryl. Looks like we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I, I've got a question. So, you know, obviously this looks like a resource would have a lot of utility practitioners. Um, what sort of feedback have you all had uh, from the practice community regarding kind of how it's being used or if it, you know, kind of what, what, what is it being used to do? Does that make sense? Are they using it? If not, maybe why not? If so, then what are they doing with it? Or is that kind of next steps kind of stuff? So I think I, I can partially answer and partially I think that's what we're going to see coming back in the, the survey that's out in the field right now. Yeah. Um, what, what has been interesting is that we've received a number of requests for um, to do uh, an informational webinar to demonstrate how it could be used. Um, the Public Health Association uh, there in Nebraska is having us come out and talk at their annual meeting in September. Um, there's a lot of buzz, and I think it's sort of one of those things that it's this it's new and it's strange, and you kind of want to poke it and see what happens. 
Um, <laughs> and I don't know that folks have completely figured out how to use it. Um, I can say from the web hits, we see good traffic going there, but what folks are doing with it, that I'm not sure yet. Um, we have some data that's coming in from uh, focus groups that were conducted and then some anecdotal information coming in from the Public Health Association of Nebraska. And I think that's where we can get into a little bit more of how is it being used. And we're also thinking about what the 2.0 version might be. We want the feedback for people to say, I wish it did this. You know, I wish I had these bells and whistles or I kicked the tires and this didn't work. I think that's what we're looking for to make sure that when we move forward to that next version, you know, we, we really want it to be to be useful. I can say from an academic perspective how I can use it and how I can do this, that, and the other. But for folks day to day, are they are they using it in the field on their phone, pulling up, saying, "Can I actually do this?" And that's that's where we are right now with trying to do that assessment. Great. Um, thanks so much. Well, I think that's all we've got for today. Um, thanks again for joining us for our webinar. Um, We've got a link to a participant survey to tell us what you think about the webinar today. Please take the time to fill that out if you have it. Um, so our upcoming webinars, um, August, September, we've got one August 20th um, regarding public health and primary care integration, um, a hot topic certainly with the Affordable Care Act. Um, we've got one looking at tribal public health, which is kind of one of those wonderful understudied areas of public health. Uh, we've also got one looking at a randomized controlled trial to increase adolescent immunization through vaccine provider best practices, and one about modeling supply chain system structure um, to look at food contamination issues. So thank you again for joining us. Once again, we do have a link to a participant survey we'd love you to take. Um, if you need anything else, have any questions, please contact Ann Kelly at the information on the screen.